Hi, my name is Mitch Kramer, and joining me on the Fluent Financial June webinar today is the head portfolio manager for Fluent Financial, Trey Talley. We're going to be talking about what we've seen happen in the past 30 days uh, with the markets, the economy, and most importantly, what changes we have made to protect and, and grow your money. Uh, the first slide is the compliance slide. The information provided is our opinions, uh, not private client services. And with that, let me go and turn this over to Trey and kind of give you an introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. And again, for those of you that got a little bit later, this uh, webinar is going to be a little shorter than we have for previous months. Uh, it looks like the number of attendees is a little bit less than we normally have as well. So, Trey, why don't you go ahead and tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Thank you, Mitch. Hello, everybody. So um, today um, we we'll start how we normally do, uh, looking here at uh, some of the ind uh, indices uh, over the past about two and a half years. And so the, the spotlight has really been on the NASDAQ tech heavy uh, indices like the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Um, and those are leading up uh, about 19 and 16 percent respectively over those times. And then the, the more cyclical L, uh, indices like the Dow Jones, the small caps, uh, those are struggling a bit more here. In the middle, you kind of have the what, what is the average stock doing? That's called the S&P equal weight. And, um, and in that with dividends is up about six percent over that time without dividends is actually flat. So in many areas of the market, it still has not recovered the highs <clears throat> from over two and a half years ago. But we want to kind of just real quick uh, for June check in and uh, check in on those stocks that are there are at stretched valuations. Now we are seeing uh, rising initial claims for unemployment. That's generally pretty important uh, for the stock market. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what's going on with inflation, the Fed, those uh, rate cuts that seems to be uh, a little delayed here. Um, and we'll talk about uh, how that's impacting some of the market uncertainty. Okay. Let's first of all uh, talk a little bit about the leading economic indicators. And this is a chart that we show on a regular basis. This basically explains where is the economy headed. And we add some colors to this in over the last couple of month, three months because Bloomberg uh, is not very good at, at color coordination. Uh, green is obviously economic growth and positive, uh, positive outcomes. The red is negative and, and pending economic downturns. And this goes back into 1960. Um, every time we have a red valley, we have this red bar, which represents a recession. Right now, here we are at, uh, we're still negative. The pace of decline has diminished. That's what this uptick means. It doesn't mean the economy is growing. It just means that the pace of decline for leading economic indicators is, is slowing. But uh, the signals are still not shining very good at all. Uh, we spent a lot of time last month talking about different uh, metrics and scientific evidence and financial records indicating where uh, recession is almost imminent. We're not going to go through all that in today's webinar. If you guys want to see those, uh, you can review our, our May webinar. So if we go to our next page, we'll talk a little bit about um, how our portfolios have done. Um, this is the year-to-date uh, performance numbers for the Dow and these major indices, and then you have the corresponding returns for our portfolios. And Trey, what I find is interesting is, you know, NASDAQ and S&P have done extremely well, and they've done extremely well primarily because of technology. If you look at one stock, and we'll spend some time talking about it later today in the video, we have a very, very narrow breadth of the market. So I want you to talk a little bit about what that means to the overall market and what we've been doing about it in our portfolios and, and helps explain our more conservative positioning. Right. So um, just like as we heard about a K-shaped economy coming out of COVID, there's been a K-shaped performance record in the market. And <clears throat> those areas which are very cyclical, you need the economy to do well. For those stocks to do well, they have just been terrible sources of investment. So that's your value stocks, your small cap. Um, and those uh, are really impacted by high inflation and high interest rates, which is still with us. Uh, there is a small uh, portion, a small faction of the market that is doing quite well. And that is getting all of the money, all of the attention. That is just generally been uh, large mega cap uh, technology stocks. And those are ones with clean balance sheets, big economic modes, high margins, and strong earnings that can protect themselves against high interest rates and high inflation. Um, but they um, are been in an anomaly. And so they're getting all the performance, but what it's created is a little bit of a bubble. And so last year is really kind of when all this started to ignite coming out of the summer. We identified it and we bought a basket of about 10 to 15% in technology stocks and some of our discretionary models, um, knowing that they were generally fairly valued, but maybe we could get uh, some earnings growth and, and multiple expansion there. And so it worked well. We made money off those. But um, 
from time to time we do call negative screening and we look at what we own and we just want to make sure that we want to own it. And we've done this recently and we figured, no, we don't want to. Uh, the money that we've made in these technology stocks, let's take it, let's um, go sit on the sidelines. The valuations have gotten dizzying. Um, in many cases, they were in the 100th percentile over the past 15 years that we were looking at. And so it just became very evident that it was not prudent to hold these names, not overstay our welcome. So in our discretionary models, all the tech is pretty much sold out of the portfolio at this point. Um, and we had a small slice of Ember investment grade corporate and international bonds that were doing better um, and out of the passive models like Grow and GWI and then those are gone. We've, we've made the exit there in the past few weeks. Um, we felt like um, at this point the, the interest rate spread that you get for taking on risk and fixed income is very low. The high quality stuff is where you want to be so that's where we went. And in the, in the stock holdings, we just realized that there was, um, you know, the market has gone so far, so fast. It needs a digestion period, and we want to be cognizant of that risk. So we're fully, um, we're 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 ready for a recession at this point. We've sold um, all of the the really overvalued, all of the risky stuff out of the portfolios. Uh, we've held on to some of it so we can make some money along the way. Uh, but now's the time to just really start um, getting really defensive here. Um, so we're, we're making a little bit of money. We're crawling. The market's running. Um, the, the problem with Vegas is not making the money. It's keeping the money. So we're going to be very diligent about the money we've made. We're going to uh, keep and ride out uh, the turbulence ahead. Yeah, and the way to look at it, everybody, we're halfway through the year. You can multiply all the numbers here on the right-hand side by two, and that's what your portfolios are pacing year to date. And none of our plans are, are using high rates of return, so you're in good shape. So, again, we're protecting uh, – significant losses and those of you who've had service meetings this year if you look at your hidden levers reports and it shows hypothetical returns if the market behaves in different manners so pull out that sheet or look at it and look at the negative 10 percent on the s p negative 20 and see how your portfolio is expected to return over a 12-month period and people that have had meetings we've had meetings with they understand what it is we're doing believe me and, and trey and i talk about this all the time we want to pivot to take more risk and have more growth. It's just not prudent to do that at this time. The majority of people on this call, you guys have worked hard and earned your money. You don't need to take a lot of risk at this juncture of the economic cycle and the market cycle. So we're going to shift gears and get into the hope slide. And this is something we've been sharing for the last few years. And the last segment of the economy before we have a recession that falls is employment. And we're starting to see that happen now with some of the economic data we'll go to momentarily. What's interesting is if you look at the housing sector, uh, specifically um, the, uh, this, the reading had fell to 43, and you have this decline in the overall um, housing sector, and this is repeated on the next slide, which is the permits, which is kind of a foretells where the housing market is headed, and this one as well is declining. And what's interesting is look what happened here over the last 30 days. It has just fallen off a cliff. And a lot of it has to do with the higher interest rates, higher inflation. And the other piece of it is a lot of the consumers are tapped out. They can't afford to buy a house or come up with a down payment. So that's going to be a drag to the overall economy. Um, Trey, I'll let you talk a little bit more about the new orders and the manufacturing. So, so very similar story in the manufacturing sector. A lot of the optimism at the early part of this year uh, was bent on trying to front run some of the election uncertainty in the back half um, in the promise of coming rate cuts uh, that none of that's materialized. So there has gone optimism in the manufacturing sector. So it's um, it's decelerating quite again here um, and, and, and quickly. So new orders here, 45 is contracting again. We only spent a few months there uh, back where the manufacturing sector in America was expanding and that has now gone behind us here. Um, so generally that's really uh, reduced and, and retracted some of the confidence that we had. Um, and maybe that soft landing, that elusive soft landing, we don't know if we'll get that. Um, these, the services sector is still kind of hanging in there. Uh, it is slowly drifting and grinding towards a recession. So uh, the, the, the positives in the economy and the services side are um, no longer quite providing those benefits. So um, when we look at different metrics of services, and the, the, excuse me, the employment uh, reading here is already in contraction. Um, the indice itself is just barely expanded. So the last leg of the economy is looking like it's getting taken out with services, uh, with manufacturing already suffering. So um, in that kind of contrast and leads us into the, the profits portion of the hope cycle. 
Yeah. Um, before we go on, whoever's on a phone call, if you could mute your uh, phone, would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, what's interesting, Trey, is the profits that have still hung in there. Can you explain to me why companies seem to be maintaining their profits while all these other sectors continue to deteriorate? Yeah, so um, profits here have kind of been uh, uh, very resilient in the face of high interest rates, uh, slowdown in consumer spending and inflation, and they've really um, tried to maximize margins, maximize efficiency, cut capex and R and D, and try and do what they can to uh, protect profitability, with the hope that we can get to the other side of this economic malaise here and interest rate cuts. And um, really, they've exhausted all of their efforts. The only thing left they can do is reduce headcount, which they're starting to do. Um, but corporate profits. Here, uh, they're up about two percent over the prior seven quarters. Um, the problem is, is that markets are up about fifty percent, and so valuations have gone from you know fairly reasonable to uh, really irresponsible in a quick fashion. Um, and so um, that's kind of what we want to have our eye on in the back half of the year. There's uh, some potential for um, some earnings recovery. We'll remain open-minded about that. Uh, but the, the picture really has been that these magnificent seven stocks have had. Uh, very strong earnings because of their moats, but the other 493 stocks in the index are actually seeing earnings guidance come down, a lot of profit warnings from them. So um, a bit of a mixed picture here. So we'll keep an eye on uh, the Q3 and Q4 of this year uh, as they develop. Yeah. So let's turn our, our attention to employment. And this is, again, the last shoe to fall before the recession starts. Uh, there's some interesting data here. We're starting to see some upticks indicating uh, further weakening in the employment market. Yeah, so this is, um, we've seen a resurgence in the initial claims for unemployment. Um, that was one of the only bright spots of the employment picture that has really started to go away here. So both initial claims for unemployment and continuing claims for unemployment are rising and they're, and they're happening in a pretty quick fashion here. This is what we see as we start to slide into a recession. This generally starts to accompany a, a market sell off here. So initial claims are back up to uh, the fear levels that we saw uh, post regional banking crisis from last year in the first quarter. Continuing claims are essentially sitting at cycle highs here. Um, so there's a lot of deterioration. Paltry benefits is what you can expect uh, if you find yourself unfortunate enough to be on these benefits. And so it's really taking a long time for people to show up and file for these. We, they've just leaned on the gig economy to help supplement their income. That's been a good thing. Uh, but now as they're starting to get more and more desperate, they're starting to reach for these benefits. Um, this is uh, generally where it starts to get a bit rocky. Yeah, and, and something an anecdotal is uh, I get gas at Costco since it's cheap and it's close to my house. Uh, when you go to a Costco, there's a guy that will spray this chemical on the concrete by the pumps. I was asking him about what that is and why he does that. And he said, well, um, what happens is people are not taking care of their cars as well, not doing maintenance on them because they don't have the money. So if people have an oil leak or some kind of problem where it's dropping fluids on the ground. Um, they're not getting that problem fixed because they can't afford it. And he goes, what happens is, is that we have these economic declines or, or prior to recessions and during the early part of recessions, they go through a lot more of that chemical to clean up the oil and the antifreeze and, and other fluids. So it just, it's, a, it's an odd data point, but it's another symbol. And depending on the circle of people you're running around with, um, people that are definitely middle class are really, really hurting right now. Um, the next slide, uh, we go we go to is oops I went too far uh, unemployment unemployment has actually popped up to four percent and the significance of this is when you look at the prior periods just before the recession this line pops up and yeah, COVID has obviously come anomaly but you're seeing this uptick here so we feel like the recession is almost imminent and one of the data charts we shared last month was showing one of the, uh, the points in May, or excuse me, October of 23, where unemployment it rose to a certain level and a recession started soon afterwards. So um, we think we're very, very close um, to a recession. Trey, what am I missing? 
that's it. Um, unemployment spiking to these levels generally on a number of different rules. Uh, you start to get triggers for a recession. You won't know these things until you look back in time, kind of the hindsight bias. So in a year, 18 months from now, you'll have to look back at this period and say, yeah, that was kind of the starting line of things. Um, but uh, unemployment is rising at the same time initial claims are rising with continuing claims. Um, this is uh, generally the cocktail we've kind of been looking for to assess whether we can really achieve the soft landing. Uh, this is evidence that we're not. Um, and so we kind of need to brace for a hard landing here. Um, markets are a bit richly valued, which we'll kind of touch on in a second. Um, but this is a time to uh, not take on risk, but uh, maybe just, um, you know, relax, take some exposure off and um, kind of assess the, in the digestion in markets. Yeah. And I'm going to change, change gears and we'll talk a little bit about inflation. When you look at inflation, um, it's down at about 3.269%. The Fed wants it to be at 2 What's been interesting is if you look at the little purple bars, that's deflationary, that's core goods. Energy is red, that's popped up over the last three months. But what's driving the, the inflation bandwagon is core services. So once you talk a bit about the core services trade and what you're seeing in that sector. Yeah, so inflation really is embedded in um, the core services of the economy here. So this is many things that we don't think about, like gym memberships and tax prep services and laundry cleaning. And um, and so we've been really sitting at <clears throat> above three percent inflation for um, uh, you know for several quarters now. And this is uh, kind of a bit an issue for the Federal Reserve, who is only hiking rates to try and slow things down. Um, they, they, they provided an antidote uh, the fiscal government did last year, which kind of stopped a lot of that progress. It's um, to, to rebalance the labor markets, to rebalance this inflation, to get the last mile achieved. It um, historically has required a recession, uh, layoffs and a loosening in the job market. Uh, we don't think this time is any different. We think that, in fact, after just talking about these unemployment statistics, we think that we're already there um, and that is in process. So disinflation is happening, um, not quite quick enough. The cumulative effect is really weighing on consumer budgets. Um, I know it, uh, we feel it in our family. Um, and when we talk to a family friends, it's really weighing on, on people. And I think you're seeing this in some of the way people are voting uh, here and abroad as well. Um, but inflation is running at about 3.3% uh, um, at, at the core services level. And uh, we think that we'll be able to get it done. There is some good news with the housing supply in the back half of the year. Um, and rates will ultimately stay at these levels um, to get this job achieved. We think that the loosening job market is really going to help this. Um, but um, that's kind of what we look like on in, a, in inflation right now. Yeah, good point. Trey, I, I think what's really been interesting on this next chart is how the jobs that get reported by our government, it seems like every month there's revisions to the downside. Um, and there's been, you know, some controversy how the government counts jobs, you know, non-farm payrolls, households, are you including the migrants and the job numbers, are you not including them? But I think what's been interesting on this chart is the, the revisions are negative, which is causing numbers to look worse than they really are. But when these revisions occur, you never see it in the media. Yeah, exactly. So there, um, there's been a number of um, revisions to last year, early preliminary revisions uh, that have reduced job counts by several hundred thousand. And so this chart here, it's very busy. It's our busiest one in the pack here, um, but it comes from Bloomberg Economics. And what they're trying to, uh, to illustrate here is if we look at last year and how jobs have been revised using their methodology, and then we look at the job growth that's kind of been, we've seen the first quarter of this year, what can we expect to see as these revisions roll in? And based on a number of different scenarios, that's kind of the, the, the gray, the blue, and the, the pink lines here. Based on various different scenarios, some aggressive, more conservative, every, every measure that Bloomberg uh, Economics team comes out with is lower jobs than what we've seen. Because if you remember, it's kind of been this bifurcation where unemployment is rising, initial claims are now kind of rising, uh, the, uh, the household employment survey shows we've lost over a million full-time jobs over the past year, but just this one little government report seems hot. Even the Fed in this most recent meeting came out and, and kind of 
just throw out a little question about the data quality and the veracity of, of the jobs report uh, in, in J-PAL's press conference. And so this is what they're trying to look at here. And, and what it does show is that when we look back here later in the year at the first quarter of this jobs growth, uh, they're going to be materially lower than where they are now. And they should be somewhere between about 140,000 to about 90,000 jobs. Now that's starkly different than the over 200,000 that we're currently looking at. Um, but this is important data uh, because if, if the Fed thinks that jobs are stronger than they are, then they will keep rates higher than they need to be for longer than they need to be. That ultimately puts more pressure on the economy and makes this whole recession a bit worse than it needs to be. So it's important to kind of get ahead, uh, to look ahead at what this data will look like. Um, and jobs are slowing down. And uh, I think the Fed is starting to appreciate that fact a little bit, uh, which is why we're looking at rate cuts. We'll, we'll kind of put some more color on that a little, little later, but rate cuts maybe around September of this year. That's what the market thinks. Um, and uh, we might get uh, two cuts this year. So, yeah. All right. So now we're going to turn our attention to how narrow the stock market is. And Bob Farrell has this famous quote. It says, markets are strongest when they're broad and weakness when they're narrow to a handful of blue chip names. And when we look at the data, what's going on in the tech space, it kind of makes me go back to uh, Prince's song, 1999, and we see a lot of parallels there. And many of you who are on this call lived through the dot-com correction, and, and some of you may even had a bunch of money invested in some of the, the high-tech names and telecoms It just went up like NVIDIA has and the smart people diversified and got out of it. Those that did not um, wrote it all the way up and wrote it all the way down. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Um, but what you, you see here is the percentage of, of the S&P stocks that have outperformed the index over the past one month through six months and then one year. If you look at the one year, only 6% of the stocks in the S&P have outperformed the overall index. That just shows how narrow the market really is. Um, so it's a very, very scary predicament. It's not a good place to investing money because this one stock has really been carrying the market. Um, there's a term people call hockey stick uh, return. That's kind of like this is a hockey stick here. And that's what NVIDIA looks like with what it's done. Um, NVIDIA has just gone up because of the AI movement. And people think that's going to be the next coming technology. And it does have a place. But Trey, talk a little bit about NVIDIA, its earnings, and its uh, share price. Yeah, exactly. So um, really tying these two charts together here, um, it, what we were looking at on the prior slide was over the past one, uh, when we look back one year in time, uh, how much of the S&P 500 has um, it beat, uh, it's been an outperforming stock, and, and that's only 30 names. So over the past year, only 30 names have actually done better than the S&P 500. Um, and so uh, when you go and invest in an economy, you don't say, well, I, I want to take this big economy and I just want to invest in one stock or 30 companies. Um, and so that what it does mean is you're not able to properly diversify in these environments. And, and so that's generally not what you see when you look back in time. So that's very stretched. The one month trailing uh, outperforming, uh, outperformance of the index versus the index, there's only about 18, uh, excuse me, 16% of those companies that are performing on a one month basis. And actually, when we look back over 100 years, we only see one other time in history in which that was the case. Um, and that was just before the Nifty 50 blow up. And so the, the, the market has increasingly become very narrow. And the door that you can enter and exit out of the market has become increasingly narrow, which means your risk kind of goes up. And so uh, particularly here for NVIDIA, they've really cannibalized a lot of the flows and demand of the market over the past year. Um, the company has been on a tear. If you own it, congratulations. Um, don't let a good idea go sour. And so this is where I, I do want to kind of say, you know, try and be tax aware. If you own some of these mega cap names, um, you know, try and be tax aware. Start rotating at a small slice. I don't care if it's 1%, but do something about it. Uh, what you don't want to have happen is emotion starts setting in as we see the other side of this mountain chart. Um, because stocks that rise very fast go down very fast. Uh, that's what this is saying here. Uh, this quote here by Bob Farrell is ra rapidly rising or falling markets go further than you think. I know that's certainly been the case for me, uh, but they do not correct by going sideways. So if you own a video or Apple or Microsoft and you're sitting on several hundred percent gains, this is a good thing. This is a good problem to have. 
but don't let the market take that away. Don't get emotional on the downside, have to sell it out, take this big tax hit and, and give back so much of the gains. Um, these are good companies, they'll remain good companies, but you have to, you always have to weigh the stock against it. And it's a risk return, um, being cognizant of these things. This, this stock, uh, these stocks, they've been really helpful for the market on the way up. And they're going to be really painful on the way down. Uh, this narrow breadth is a double-edged sword and it cuts both ways. So um, what we would ad advise is put something like Mitch is saying here, a trailing stop loss on your positions. If you're not familiar with that, reach out to us. We will help you find the levels. But what that is essentially doing is we're saying, hey, we're going to put a we're going to put an order out there in the market that'll sell my position, but it's going to give it some room to work. So if it keeps going up, great, I stay invested. But if it retraces a certain percent, I'll be out. I'll take some I'll take some chips off the table and I'll move on. Um, that's what we would. That's what I would advise doing here. Um, these uh, these stocks have pulled forward a lot of the future. If it is trading at 45 times earnings, that means if everything goes amazing next year and earnings come in as they should, um, you need 45 years to get your earn your investment back. That's generally about three times the average multiple on the market. Um, and so these stocks can go up several hundred percent, and that's great. But they can go down 100%. And NVIDIA is going to be a great company, but it regularly goes on more than 40% drawdowns from here. Um, and so we just kind of want to set that, that expectation here. Um, just, you know, just kind of think, be proactive like, um, like we always try to be and, and do these things now while we can, not when everybody's rushing for the exits here. That's, that's when you don't want to be. That's where you don't want to be. Yeah, and, and again, those of you who want to discuss trailing stop losses, the mechanics, how they work, you know, please reach out to us. To continue on the valuation theme, once you talk about the elevated risk levels we're seeing in the overall markets, Trey. So the market is um, incredibly rich here. Um, it's mostly the richness is coming from these magnificent seven names. Uh, there are some lower valued areas in the market, but they're just not performing. This chart here is illustrating that. So it's going back to 1985. The red line is the S&P 500. And the blue lines around that are just forward multiples of earnings. So when you buy a company, you buy the strong earnings power, but you always have to pay a price on that. There's going to be some sort of multiple. Where we are now um, in, the, in the low 20s here, about 22 forward earnings is incredible incredibly rich. Uh, that's uh, just over 30 percent uh, kind of fair value range for the markets. Um, we have seen worse uh, valuations, particularly going into the tech bubble. But those were not good times to be a buyer, uh, not even for the next almost 10 years in markets. Um, so uh, we kind of want to be cognizant here. This is where we can add value, reduce risk, and, and just be aware of what you're buying um, and the value that you have to pay for. Uh, so the market's very rich and which brings higher risk um, I think that's self-evident. Yeah. Let's turn our attention to our, our friends in France. There was a, a recent election there, and uh, the elected officials did not inspire confidence in the market. Uh, we've seen a similar type of performance in Mexico at their recent election. Why don't we talk a little bit about the impact of political elections on markets and why both France and Mexico have, have gone down? Yeah, exactly. So this is the, the CAC 40 in France. It's just their version of kind of the S&P 500. And um, what's important to note here, so what, what has happened, um, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, she leads what is called the far right party. And um, their party has done very well in some of the preliminary elections there. And so now there's just kind of really, it's upset the, bal the balance of power from some of the centrists and liberals in France, where you now have the far right and the far left party, which really hold power here. Both of them kind of have unorthodox um, kind of visions for the near term future. And so that's setting off a wave of uncertainty. Um, this can happen in France, it can happen in Mexico, it can happen in the US. Um, but this is kind of the uncertainty that's reeling through. Spreads on uh, French bonds are kind of expanded here uh, more than the, um, the COVID crisis. The, the, the French stock market was down almost 10% in less than 30 days. Uh, there's a market saying that risk happens fast. This is a reminder of that. You will not always get 40 reminders that, hey, you're, you're going to miss your exit. Hey, you're going to miss your exit. Hey, you're going to miss your exit. Um, so perhaps a preview um, of kind of some of the uncertainty that we may see in the U.S. In Mexico, they're dealing with a lot 
Um, they've got a new woman president, and she's talking, talking about making judicial reforms. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty on the integrity of the institutions on the other side of that. So Mexican markets are down about 20% in just over a month there, and their yields are blowing up, and their Mexican peso is falling. Um, and so there's kind of um, there's just a weird ripple of political geopolitical uh, uncertainty out there. Um, it hasn't made it its yet. Uh, it hasn't made its way yet to the U.S., but it's something we're watching. Yeah, yeah. It's just overall in in Europe, and, and it's true in this country. Anytime people in power move to the fringes, left or right, there's normally a uh, snap back to the center area, and we're seeing that happen. Um, a lot of Europeans think anybody that's not left, by definition, is far right. Um, th that's very commonplace. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens here. But Europe has generally been much more liberal and, and socialistic than our country has. And a lot of the people there are, haven't been happy with the policies and procedures. The Green New Deal, the energy, uh, all these rules and regulations against farmers. A lot of your Dutch farmers have parked tractors on highways to protest, you know, uh, regulations. And, and the people have had enough of it. And they have immigration problems with people from the Middle East and Africa. And like a lot of people in this country, they don't assimilate. And every country in Europe is very proud of their tradition and background. And they welcome these people to their country and expect them to assimilate not not to in, increase crime in their in their in their country. So Germany and Sweden specifically they had a lot of problems w w with their migrant immigration. So a part of this may be the immigration problems that France has had, but you're starting to see a, a turnover in the elections uh, in Europe and in Mexico. Um, next thing we'll talk about is interest rate projections. And Trey mentioned this before. And we we show this chart every month. This is when the Fed meets. Their next meeting is going to be in July. The current interest rates are 5.25 to 5.5 percent, and the first rate cut is anticipated to be in September. And you can see these other rate cuts that are anticipated to uh, occur. And this is basically saying we're not going to have a recession. If we have a recession, you're going to see the Fed move much more quickly to cut rates to try to keep the economy out of a bad recession. Trey and I both feel like the Fed has been slow to move at our country's demise. And specifically, there was an inflation problem. They were too slow to raise rates. And when they did start to raise rates, they raised them very quickly. And they raised them so quickly, they basically generated the worst year in the history of the bond market in 2022. We feel like on the backside of this, they're going to be too, uh, too late to cut rates and the recession may be worse. But what we've done in the portfolios to protect our protect you from this is we've had a lot more bonds, higher quality bonds. Many of you have the T-bond ladder. Those strategies will profit nicely when the equity compo component of your portfolios go down. So that's what we, we have done um, to kind of uh, control what's going on with risk in, in the marketplace. The next slide is our options portfolio showing the amount of income that we're generating. Um, our targeted percents and on a million dollars, our trailing 12 months, as you can see here, which really been interesting is advantage trailing 12 months has done better than our stock income portfolio. And that mainly, it mainly has to do with the, the NASDAQ and the S&P indexes have had a good growth. So we've been able to get better call premiums. So we are not going to be able to sustain this 8.44%. It will revert back down closer to five. The stock income, Trey and, and Nick have done a really good job there because this 8.19% has been done with 20 to 25% of the portfolio not riding covered calls regularly. It's been sitting in 30 to 80 bills. So once we feel more comfortable about investing in stocks, 100% stock income, that this call income number will probably increase somewhat. Um, the other thing we've done to the stock income is add the long duration bond fund uh, from Vanguard, the ticker symbol is EDV, that we have in some of our model portfolios. Again, we're using that as a trade. When interest rates come down, that particular bond holding will have pretty significant appreciation. So that covers the webinar. We talked a little bit about what the markets have done since uh, the beginning of, of 22. Uh, economically, what we see happening, we see deterioration in earnings. Housing starts, the unemployment numbers are continuing to look worse. We're probably very close to a, a recession. 
Uh, we've talked about the inflation problem. The services are, are still relatively high. We talked about the, uh, the advantages of being in bonds and having uh, more bonds in the portfolio. And we'll make a pivot to more equities as we go through a recession and the equity markets go down. So um, we'll go ahead and open this up for questions. We, 